And welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk in search of Christianity. And here is Dryden, New York, in upstate New York. And Alice and I are joined by Bob and Pam Rizzoni. So we're just all blessed that we can be with you this Amen. evening. Yes. If indeed it's this evening when you're watching. Amen. So before we start, we're going to pick up in uh, our study of the Sermon on the Mount. And we're still in the Beatitudes. And Tonight we're going to start with, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Brother Bob if you will ask God's blessing upon our time together. Well, Father, we just thank you for your goodness and your mercy, Lord thank God. You, Jesus. Father, we thank you that you care for us all the time, yes, Lord. that you never leave us nor forsake us. And we ask for your presence here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. We're, the topic for tonight, as I said, is mercy, yes. right? I want to read the dictionary definition of the word mercy so we have common ground and we know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The Random House Dictionary says that mercy is kindly forbearance shown towards an offender or an enemy. Yeah. Or it's the discretionary power of a judge to pardon someone or to mitigate punishment. Or it's compassionate treatment of of an or an attitude towards an offender an adversary okay I the one thing I want to make a point of here okay it certainly is forbearance it's being kind to your enemies uh, offenders mm -hmm. the second one the discretionary power of a judge to pardon someone or mitigate punishment we're talking about the mercy of God and I want to make it clear right off the bat he does not have the right to pardon somebody from the law he spoke to Jeremiah and said he watches over his word to perform it. The word says that it cannot be broken. Jesus said that God cannot lie. So God is bound by what he has proclaimed and spoken. He's bound by his word. He does not have the freedom to break his own commandments. Okay? So I, I want to make that clear right off, right off the bat. And when we're talking about mercy, this is something that is so important to the Lord. You know, Hosea uh, in 8.6 six. It says, this is God speaking through the prophet. And he said, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. God, did, his desire in our lives is that we would show mercy because we have been shown mercy, right? But mercy, apart from the knowledge of God, is no more than man's sympathy. You have to understand God. You have to know God in order to have, show and use the mercy of God. Right now, we're going to get right into this in a very deep theological way here. <laughs> in order to understand mercy, you have to understand the mercy seat. Okay, when God brought the Hebrews out of Egypt and in, you know delivered them through the parted Red Sea by the hand of Moses and Aaron, one of the first things He did is He commanded that, uh, that uh, the, the tabernacle, right? the Ark of the Covenant, be built. Mm -hmm. right. And I want to, to read a part of that, all right? So I'm reading here from Exodus, Exodus 25, and I'm starting in verse 17. And God commanded Moses, and he said, You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide. You shall make two cherubim of gold, make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat, Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim of one piece of, with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give to you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the Ark of the Testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. 
Okay, how important is this? Mm -hmm. This is the place where God and man yes. meet, is in the in, 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 at the mercy seat, right. at, the, at the Ark of the Covenant. This is what wound up in the temple, right. right? It was protected by the veil. It was so holy that only the high priest could enter to be in there, and, and that only once a year, right? right? This is a replica of what is in heaven? Absolutely. Now, here's where it gets a little bit theological, but this is important, and you'll, I think you won't have any problem with this. The Hebrew word for that mercy seat is kapareth, okay? okay? The Greek word is hilasterion. Now, that's the Greek word that's used in the New Testament and used in the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, which was a Greek version of the Old Testament made by 70 rabbinical or Jewish Bible scholars. And then in the Latin, it was called the propitiation. It comes from the word for propitiation. So these are the words that are important, propitiation, kapareth, illusterion, all right? Because the kapareth was literally the place where God and man met, okay? And then it says in Romans, Paul wrote in Romans and said, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But, in, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by, witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, comes through Jesus Christ. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, who God publicly displayed as a propitiation, illusterion, in his blood through faith. Sure. And I, I just want to read you a few verses here because I want you to get the get a grasp on this. In Hebrews 2.17, it says that therefore he, Jesus, had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And he himself, it says in 1 John 2, 2, is the propitiation for our sins. Okay, and then First John four it says, "In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation. Mm -hmm. That's the mercy seat. That's the capareth, mm -hmm. the place, the place for us. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That's one Timothy two five. So the mercy seat of God has a name." And the name is Jesus Christ. The mercy seat of God has a place, and the place is Jesus Christ. Jesus is literally the place where God Almighty and man meet for the forgiveness of sins, mercy. And that's why when Jesus said that, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. There is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. Because only in Jesus and through Jesus can our sins be remitted. That's the only place where you can come together with God the Father. Okay? All right, I'm going to read from John 8 now. This is a Bible study, so please don't be surprised that I read the Bible. Okay. John 8, starting in verse 2. And I, well, I may not even read all of this, because you'll, I'm sure you all know the story. And in the early morning, he, Jesus, came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, having set her in the midst. And they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law of Moses, God, God commanded us to stone to, to stone the one caught in adultery. In the, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you say? That's what they said to Jesus. What do you say? And they were saying this, testing him, in order that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. When they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him to be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the midst. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Does no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way. From now on, sin no more. 
but he's telling her to change. Yes. He's telling her to repent, yes. to have a changed mind, right? Absolutely. There is no relationship with God without repentance. God is both just and merciful, right? He's a just and merciful Savior, and, he does, and his mercy does not annul or invalidate justice. No. This is where a lot of the church goes wrong today and in the past. Uh, to, to get to a place where what Paul called licentiousness. You think because of the mercy of God, because of the grace of God, you can do whatever you want. Okay? Okay. I want you to know that he is... Well, let me just read this. This is from Isaiah. By Isaiah 45. God says, Is it not I the Lord, and there is no other God beside me, a just God and a Savior? There is none except me. Once again, there is no Savior outside of God through Jesus Christ. So Jesus did not erase the punishment for that woman's sin. He chose to take it upon himself. Right? Mercy is where law and grace meet. You see, the law, which requires death as payment for sin, is not broken by grace. Right. It transfers the punishment. Right. Yes. The payment is always required and the Father's mercy places it on Jesus. That's what I meant. God the Father has, does not have the right to say, okay, well, I'm just going to forgive you. The price has to be paid. Right. No sin goes unpunished. Right. You know, it says in Romans 12, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. <clears throat> the point of that is, our being merciful in the face of offense does not mean that evil is not dealt with. Us being nice, gracious, and merciful to, to, the, to the enemies, to those who abuse us, and this is what the Sermon on the Mount deals with so much. It's just saying, God says, that's his job to deal with it, not ours. You see, mercy apart from the justice of God is a deception of the enemy. That's licentiousness. That's what I'm going to say right now. The one thing, the single thing, that differentiates the Hebrew Mosaic Levitical law and Islamic Sharia law from Christ's fulfilled royal law of love is mercy laid upon justice and judgment. There's no mercy in Islamic law. No. Right. There's not much mercy in the Levitical law. No. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Yeah. The only difference is somebody steps in and takes the punishment in your place. Mm -hmm. That's, that is both the mercy and the judgment of God. Right? Christ didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Mm -hmm. God's judgment, God's justice, demands blood for sin. Right? That's what it says, Leviticus 17, 11. There's no atonement for sin without the shedding of blood, for life is in the blood. All right? Life is in the blood. God's judgment demands death for sin, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. All right? So God still demands that today. That's New Testament. You know, the wages of sin is death. Sure. But mercy provided the blood. By his stripes we are healed. And mercy provides the death. Jesus hung on the cross and prayed for the Father's mercy upon those who were responsible for Jesus being there, which was me and you and every human being on earth. Right? His mercy was Jesus hung there beaten in ways we can't begin to understand. And he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the mercy of God. And then Jesus hung on that cross, shed his blood, and died, thus fulfilling the justice and judgment of God. He said, it is finished, bowed his head, and gave up his spirit. John 19, 30. You can't, you can't take away, and a lot of people would, take away the judgment and justice of God in this day and age. I'm sorry. That doesn't work. The mercy of God is expressed in Jesus Christ. But the judgment of God is expressed in Jesus Christ. It's if intertwined. You, if you can accept that. Mm -hmm. If you don't accept it, you know what? The wrath of God is going to fall on you. Right. Mm -hmm. 
We are saved. But you know what Paul says in Romans? We are saved from the wrath of God. And if you reject the saving grace of Jesus Christ in your life, you will face the wrath of God because God is just. So the free gift, and you, and because you have rejected His mercy. So the free gift He's giving us is mercy. Is the mercy absolutely, and that's what, and that's what, by and large, is not there in the Levitical law. Right. That's definitely what is not there in the Sharia law. That's right. That's why it's called the royal law of love. Hmm. Right. I, I think this is cool stuff. It's amazing. I, I really do. Right. It's so logical. It is. <laughs> yeah, but you don't just. It doesn't just come to you unless you know the scriptures. You're yeah, not going to yeah. know. No, you're not no, going to no. get it. No. You have to be yeah. in the Word. Yeah. You have to be in the Word. That's... You know this, this story in, in Luke, uh, two men go into the temple. One is the righteous Pharisee, mm. and one is the this, this sinner in the back right. back of right. the synagogue. And, and he's saying, you know, the, the Pharisee is saying, thank God I'm not like him. Right. And he's saying, you know, God, be merciful right. to me, a sinner. Be yeah. merciful to me, a sinner. Yeah, yeah. Right. And what it says is, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Mm. This is, mercy is where the humble and the king meet. Yeah. Mm. You know, want another place? Of course you do. Bethesda. Bethesda in John 5, 2, literally means house of mercy. Mm, that's right. That's yeah. Right. The word Beth, it's you know, house. Beth is house. Yes. Beth is house, mm -hmm. right? <coughs> Bethlehem is the house of bread. Mm -hmm. Beth Debar. We first came together back in here in New York, but downstate New York, in the suburbs of New York City, back in the seventies, when when Late 70s. we had started a congregation, and the name of the congregation was Beth Debar, house. which means house, house of the word. Years later, I started another congregation down in Florida that was called Beth Hallel, the House of Praise. Right? See, now it says there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind and lame and withered, waiting for the movement of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at a certain season into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, and after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease in which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him and said, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Mm -hmm. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. That was at a place that is called the house of mercy. The of mercy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, it says in Hebrews 13, is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. That mercy, that grace, that love of God is the, the same today as it was 2,000 years ago. And if you call out to Jesus, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I encourage you, regardless of what your situation is, regardless of what problem you might be experiencing, call upon the name of the Lord. He because is he is merciful. He is merciful. Yes, he is. And yes, you know what? You can be a dirty rat. You can be a bad person. But the simple fact of the matter is, that's all there are in this world. That's it. I mean, there is none righteous, not even one. That's what it was. So it is the grace of God that, that if, you know, do you probably know this verse? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever would receive him, would believe, will have that eternal life. And by his stripes, his shed blood, we are healed. Let me ask a question. We're looking at verse 7. It says, Blessed are the merciful, yes. for they shall receive mercy. Yes. It's kind of a strange statement right. because how can you give what you don't have? But in giving what you have, do you receive more? From whom? Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, I mean if, you're, you can't, if you haven't received mercy from God, you can't give it. If you don't have it. And, and yet, it says, for they shall receive mercy. 
So it's, it's, it's a continual, you know, we are sinners saved by grace. Guess what? I need mercy all the time. Yes. That's mercy right. is new each because, morning. Well, no, I mean, this, that, that's, that is the second part, and it is. This is a cyclical thing. Yeah. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Mm -hmm. Well, you couldn't be merciful had you, not, had you already not received mercy. Right. Exactly. Okay? And it's not a vicious circle, hallelujah. Wow. It's a hallelujah yeah. circle, right. Right? Right. 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 right? Don't be deceived. God is not mocked, it says. For whatever, whatever a man sows, he so will also reap. You put out mercy, you're going to get mercy. But you have the power to do that because you have been the yes. beneficiary of mercy, all right? It's not about earning the mercy of God, but being faithful stewards of God's gift of mercy that he's already given you. This is what Peter wrote, right? When Peter said, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 1 Peter 4.10. Did you say, I'm sorry, did you say that people before... It, before they receive God's mercy, what they only have to give is sympathy. They have. That's exactly that's right. Okay. That, that really is well, that's right. Why, that's yeah. why I right. want that. At the yes. But see, and but it, it's kind of, you're empowered to do this because you have been forgiven, yes. which is receiving the mercy of God. Right. 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 And because you have been forgiven much, you should be prepared right. to forgive much. Right. 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 That's, this is the gospel. And this is, this is, you know, we were talking. We were having a conversation earlier today when we were fellowshipping and, and praying earlier, and I was talking about a time when I had been asked to teach the Our Father mm -hmm. at a at a church in upstate New York, and this was going back almost forty years. And when I did, it created a great stir because really, what people wanted me to do was help teenagers memorize the Our Father. <laughs> they called the wrong guy to do that. Because I said, that, you know, the, the Our Father is one of the most beautiful prayers. It, and it's not, you know, it's not the Lord's Prayer. That's a misnomer. It, you want to know, that's the church's prayer. Yeah. He said, when you pray, pray this way. You know what the Lord's Prayer is? Not my will, but thy will be done. That's the Lord's Prayer. And that's what we need to get to. But that prayer, beautiful as it is, you realize basically what it says in the middle of there is, you're asking God... The instruction of Jesus is ask God the Father and say to him, Father, don't forgive me any better than I forgive others. Yes. Forgive us our debts as we forgive others. The way, the way we forgive others, mm -hmm. we'd like you to forgive us. That's scary unless you are walking in the fullness of the grace of God, Amen. which is what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. Okay? You have received so much. You have received the, the fullness of the mercy of God. That's what you now have to give. And the thing is, the more you give, the more he will pour into you. The more mercy you will receive, the deeper your understanding of mercy will be. When you begin to go out and be merciful to the unlovable, you will begin to understand what true mercy is. That's what Jesus did. Had he not done that, we wouldn't be here tonight. We'd be out carousing and doing bad things and because it's only by the mercy and grace of God that we are here in His Word, right? It's kept us. But God gave it to us. You know, it says in Second Corinthians, Paul wrote, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Mm -hmm. He is pouring His mercy into you. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing thing. When Peter questioned Jesus about how many times he must forgive, as much as seven times, he said. Should I forgive somebody as much? And I can kind of see Peter saying this with some indignation. You know, what are you? Uh, you expect me to forgive seven times? Yeah. And Jesus said to him, I did not say to you up to seven times, but 70 times seven. Matthew 18, 22. Now, by and large, I don't like to paraphrase scripture, but I'm going to paraphrase that. How many times should you forgive? One more time. Always one more time. Forgiveness should be bursting out of our heart because the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. When Jesus said that, you know, he went on to tell this parable. For the kingdom of heaven, for this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. Now I'm, I'm reading from Matthew, right? Matthew 18, 23. When he had begun to settle them, the one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment be made. Justice is justice, right? Yes. Yes. So that slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, 
Have patience with me, Lord, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, with his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger. There's a righteous anger. Mm -hmm. Handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. I want to tell you that unforgiveness will cripple you. It will cripple you spiritually. And so many times I've seen it cripple people physically. Absolutely. It has incredible power. Release that. Do good. What was, what would G, what was Paul saying in Romans? You have somebody who's doing you harm. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Bless him. Forgive him. God will deal with him. Yes. It's God's job, yes. not yours. Vengeance is mine. Say it's the Lord. Absolutely. So, you know, my desire, we, we were having this conversation as we were driving up to Dryden. I don't remember what brought it about, talking about success. Uh, I used to do a seminar. Or I've done seminars on success in business and one of the reasons I retitled that was because if you ask 100 people to define success, they'll have 115 different answers. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, for a Christian, there is only one definition of success. Only one. Only one. And that is when you meet him face to face, his master will say to him, to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Yes. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master, Matthew 25. If you don't hear those words, I don't care what you've accomplished on this earth, you failed. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you've accumulated on this earth, mm -hmm. you failed. Right. That is the measure of success, is that you have been pleasing to God. And you will be pleasing Him if in imitation of Him, you pour out mercy and love. Trust me. He will take care of the justice yes. because he is just and Absolutely. his judgments are just. Absolutely. We are now his ambassadors. We're ambassadors for Christ. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. We have a ministry of reconciliation. Yes. That's bringing people to the knowledge of the Lord that they might come to him. The purpose and manifest manifestation of God's mercy is that reconciliation. That's the purpose of it all. Yes. We, we, us, usins, not a church building, are the place, the temple of the Holy Spirit, where the lost can meet God. That's why it says, But thanks be to God, who always leads us in the triumph of Christ, and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Jesus in every place. 2 Corinthians 2. You have an incredible power to bring the love, the forgiveness, the grace, the mercy of God into other people's lives. Father, I pray that we would be faithful to use for you what you have given to us, that we might receive all the more and be equipped to do all the more. We praise you and thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our propitiation. In God's name, I pray that. So, until next time, and don't forget to be back, same time, same place. Maybe not. Maybe not. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners